County Facilities meeting and ask for a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting by Ron. Second by Matt. Any discussion, changes, deletions? Hearing none, call the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Or so moved. Turn it right over to Jeffrey. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no action uh, agenda for this special meeting. Uh, I have no update on the referral items number four. Uh, really, the key, meet, the key purpose of this meeting was to have uh, Mr. Tim Hens. He's the superintendent of highways from Genesee County. Um, we wanted him to come in and uh, discuss with us what Genesee County did regarding their airport, which he oversees, and their conversion from a private FBO to a municipal FBO. And Tim, before we call on you, maybe I have Ed, do you want to uh, do any introduction or? Well, we might add that I know some members uh, of the uh, committee and others uh, may have had conversations uh, with uh, Tim, and I thought it would be uh, informational. Uh, the situation here in uh, Ward County may not uh, tie up on all fours with Genesee, but I, I think it's just to show that there are other uh, options uh, out there in uh, New York State to take a look at. And uh, we found in our conversation, I saw with John, I know Travis has spoken to him in the past as well, and with Mark Westcott and others, that um, good information was exchanged, and uh, I think it just adds to the wealth of information as the board goes through your RFP process. So we're delighted that uh, Tim from Genesee, outside of Buffalo, had a number of uh, inches of snow, went to <laughs> Buffalo Bills game last uh, yesterday, and then drove in this morning to uh, meet with us this morning. So we thank you very much for uh, stopping by this morning. Well, thanks for having me. I'm glad I didn't get buried at the stadium, and I'm glad the roads are open this morning to get here. So. Okay. Tim, thank you. This is very uh, informational as far as what you can bring to us. Uh, anyone in this room later on may will have questions for you possibly, and whatever you can deliver to us, we appreciate it uh, because we're in a process now of trying to do the best thing for the county and find out what, uh, what our avenues are and, and what possibly we could execute to make it the best fiscally responsible project that we have and uh, we've been pretty thorough about everything and I think you're an important piece to all of it. So having said that, I'd turn the podium over to you. Well, I'm you know, just here to offer my experience. Um, again, it may or may, you know, Genesee County to Warren County may be apples to oranges um, and we may, maybe we're similar and maybe just different scope uh, size of operation, but I'll share with you um, our experience and, you know, answer any questions that are asked of me as best, as best that I can. Um, Genesee County, uh, for those of you who don't know, is located directly between Rochester and Buffalo on, route, on I-90, right on the thruway. Uh, our county airport is about a mile north of the thruway exit in Batavia, uh, which is exit 48. Um, so we have a pretty good location between Buffalo and Rochester. Strictly a GA airport. Uh, there's no passenger service, no Part 139 or anything like that. It's just uh, uh, we have a 5,500 foot runway. It uh, was expanded from a 4,500 foot runway in 2005. Uh, prior to that time, we were pretty much strictly a very much a recreational, uh, you know, type airport. And uh, since that time, we've really been kind of more more focused on chasing business traffic, um, small planes. Um, and we have a couple base jets now at the airport, which has been beneficial to us. Um, we try to just give you some quick numbers of where we are size-wise. We have about 60 based aircraft. Um, we sell about 135,000 gallons of fuel a year. Probably two-thirds of that is jet fuel, and the other third is 100 low lead. Uh, the county owns and operates the airport. We have a full-time airport manager. We have one full-time, we call a classification of an airport attendant, uh, who basically uh, runs our line service for us. And we also have uh, three part-time fuel attendants that fill in uh, nights, weekends, holidays, uh, vacations, stuff like that. So we basically have, um, uh, what was that, in FTEs, three and a half? and a half FTEs at the airport. Uh, we do contract out with our facility maintenance staff for all the facility maintenance at the airport and the uh, custodial uh, services are contracted from our central services department uh, which is our kind of our purchasing central
printing office and things like that. Um, County Highway provides all of the mowing, plowing, uh, kind of all the horizontal maintenance at the airport, uh, pavement maintenance, uh, plowing, um, you know, tree trimming, things like that. So we do charge back on all that uh, to show we try to operate the airport, which is a which is a general fund, a fund. Uh, we try to operate it like an enterprise fund as best we can. Uh, county Highway has been operating our county airport since 2001. In that time, we have profited on our operations um, every year except for one year. Uh, our biggest, uh, I guess, our biggest loss was in 2008, kind of in the deep part of the recession where. Uh, business traffic dropped off quite a bit and flying dropped off. The fuel prices were real high. Uh, we lost $15,000 in 2008. Um, I would say on average over that time, at least since the runway extension was completed in 2005, our, based on operations, we surplus anywhere between ninety dollars to $130,000 a year. Um, the county has a fairly robust capital plan, ACIP, that we follow with the FAA. Uh, in the time that, that I've been with the county, which is 20 years, we've pretty much redone the entire airport. Uh, there isn't, there's only one facility left standing at the airport that predates 1998. It's an old set of T-hangers that was built in the 60s. We've completely redone the runway, the taxiways, most of our parking ramps. Um, all of our T-hangers have been constructed since 98 exception of that one facility I previously mentioned. Um, we've rebuilt our main terminal and uh, main hangar within the last two years. That was a county funded project uh, bonded by the airport and uh, we did have some outside help from the state on that, about a million dollars. But the county's paying, debt service wise, we're paying um, right now about $325,000 a year in debt service on our main terminal building and we are using our right now using our airport surplus, the, the, the deferred revenue, to contribute toward that uh, with the hopes at some point in the future our surplus, our annual surplus, would be enough to cover the entire debt payment uh, each year rather than dipping into the deferred revenue that we have. Um, prior to 2001, the county had a um, basically a conglomeration of FPO configurations, pri mostly private. Uh, prior to 19, I would say 1998, it was solidly a private FBO. Uh, it was a very uh, bad relationship for the county. Uh, the, the FBO was accused of um, misreporting revenue figures, uh, which the county based its revenue off of. Uh, There's a lot of controversy in the community. The airport was a very negative um, item. It was in the press all the time. Uh, our county legislature would uh, argue about it quite a bit at, at county meetings. Uh, it had the moniker in the local paper as the rich man's playground. And uh, the county, in, through several years, from 98 to 2001, the county went back and forth of what to do with the airport. Uh, we had fired our airport manager at one point and hired a, they actually hired Passero Associates, which is a, actually an aviation engineer group. Uh, Passero kind of came in and did a private, even though they were our engineers, they also kind of privately operated the airport for the county. Uh, and we, we had one of our limited fixed based operators, one of our main, uh, air aircraft maintainers, kind of providing the fuel service by contract and Passero was handling the hangar rentals uh, through their contract. And it was just very um, confusing as to who was in charge. The revenue was very difficult to track. I think at the, in, 99 or 2000, we were probably losing about $200,000 a year. Um, and the county finally settled on, uh, in 2001, settled on going out to a, uh, they were going to go completely to a private FBO, turn the entire thing over. Um, maintenance, fuel sales, hair rentals, the whole, sh whole caboodle was going to go to a private FBO. Um, we put an RFP out. Our uh, RFP opening date was September 18th of 2001, which if you remember the calendar, what happened on September 11th of 2001, there wasn't a whole lot of interest in what we were trying to offer at our airport and we got zero bids back on our RFP.
because the whole aviation industry was upside down. No one knew what uh, security was going to turn into, what insurance was going to evolve into, and uh, the county really didn't have a choice at that point um, aside from looking inside and saying they actually came to me. I was fairly new at the time. I was only had been with the county for three or four years, uh, but I was a uh, had former experience in the Air Force. Was a graduate of the Air Force Academy. Uh, my background in the Air Force was aviation engineering, and they basically turned to me and said, "Hey, you're doing a pretty good job with the highway department. Why don't you consider running the airport?" Um, so we took over the airport. We hired an airport manager. Um, completely took over all the revenue for the fuel the hangar rentals, all the land leases, um, and then went went whole hog into um, promoting the runway extension, which at the time we felt would boost our fuel sales by bringing in jet traffic, which it did. Uh, the, the runway extension went through in 2005, and like I said, since then it's been pretty, um, pretty good for revenue and, and, and creating basically a profit at the airport. Um, at the same time, um, I went through a pretty heavy period of time of basically promoting the airport. We had a lot of um, tours of the airport for community groups, Rotary and um, Kiwanis came out. Uh, we had some of our Leadership Genesee, which is a kind of a grassroots homegrown leadership program. Uh, we had them come out on an annual basis and tour the airport and learn about it and learn about the impact to the community and the indirect benefit of having an airport and how it supports the economy and things like that. And we went through probably a good eight to ten year period of time of trying to educate the public on the benefit of the airport and how it was operated and how we were surplusing money. And uh, slowly over time we got away from the, uh, the rich man's playground moniker and the airport became, became more of a positive uh, thing in the paper and in the community. So I guess that's kind of the Cliff Notes version of of my experience and my history, so I would be uh, glad to take any questions or answer anything the best I can. Ron? Tim, I have uh, just three questions. Number one, you might want to explain what Part 139 or Part 39 is. I'm not sure everybody know. You you don't have a... We do not have... It's generally related to passenger service uh, or chartered passenger service, which we do not. We do not have that. We do not, we do not uh, have anyone offering charter flights. Um, no passenger pickup. There's no TSA. It's just a general aviation uh, business airport. Okay. I thought it also included uh, kind of lights and turn the lights on, turn the lights off when you're flying in. Is that part of? Something? No, we have uh, we have an ILS system at our airport. Okay. ILS. Um, okay. Yeah, and the you know the pilots can turn the lights on and off by clicking the radio uh, as long as they're dialed into our Unicom frequency. Um, we're un we're untowered. We don't have a tower. It's totally a uh, non-towered airport. You have food service at, at the uh, terminal? We have space for a cafe, but we do not yet have it rented out. And then what would your total budget be? For, you know, Our budget right now is pretty close to a million dollars per year for revenue and expenses. Thank you. Any other questions? Doug? So you're turning a profit of about uh, would you say about 90,000 a year to 130? Is that right, Tim? 90 to 130. That's based on on operations only. When you figure in our capital payments on ACIP projects and our on our maintenance hangar, we're probably closer to break even, uh, which I think is still a pretty good place to be in. Because you're paying 325 a year uh, just for a building uh, upgrade or whatever. You did. Right. We've got we have a deferred revenue account that's got a couple million dollars in it, and we have our annual surplus going toward those debt payments on the building. Okay. All right. What's the length of the rear runway? 5,500 feet. And it used to be what, 30 something? It was, it was 4,500 feet, which was, um, we used to get some jets before that. Um, it was very few and far between and really generally pretty small jets just because the length wasn't long enough to land them. The thought to go into 5,500 was it jumps you up um, you know, to a Lear 35, a, a little bit more of a common business jet, larger business jets, more fuel, more revenue. So, 5,000 feet is kind of the cutoff from an, usually from an insurance standpoint for operators of planes. Yeah. 
Well, I've heard that over and over and over again, that airports that extended the runway and the relationship between that and jet fuel sales occurred exponentially with the jet fuel sales and the extension of the runway and what that brought in for revenue. I heard that from other airports as well. We have, um, prior to 2005, our jet fuel sales were about 20,000 gallons a year. And we are closer to 80,000 gallons a year now. So our jet fuel sales have quadrupled in, since in the last 12 years, since the extension. Travis? <coughs> Good morning, Tim. Uh, Travis Whitehead. We spoke first about five years ago. Yeah. And at that time, I was uh, questioning the, uh, the contract that we're just about, well, we're at the end of another five-year contract. And one of the things that was bothering us at that point in time was the fact that we, were, we, we are getting seven and a half cents a gallon on the fuel sales. And I remember when I mentioned that to you, you kind of snickered. Um, uh, we, at that time, felt that you know, we should probably be having a better uh, uh, return. And uh, I think at that time you indicated the margins were probably closer to a dollar a gallon. Uh, our, our margins on jet fuel yep. are, we, we mark our jet fuel up $2 a gallon. Our 100 low leads usually marked up about a dollar, dollar ten a gallon. And we do offer base discounts, so usually 30 to, anywhere between 30 to 50 cents based on volume and and size of the operation. So even with the base discounts, we're still at 80 cents markup for 100 low lead, and probably, I guess in our lowest case, probably about $1.50 for jet, jet fuel. So we, at that time, were hoping to renegotiate the contract so we get a little bit more than seven cents. But as it turned out, the discussion went into the point in time where you had to make a decision, and so everything was left as We have seen, though, uh, quite an expansion. We, back then, we had two base jets. Now we have six, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, that was done through private expansion. We had millions of dollars uh, put in here by uh, private uh, investment uh, to build some hangars and to bring in, you know, four additional jets. And that's you know, increased the, the fuel flow considerably. I think we're in a pretty good shape with that. We do have a 5,000 foot runway. And um, all of the data that I've seen on that is that 5,000 is, is enough. Uh, we actually have one of the base jets uh, flew out of here. You know, as you know, runway length uh, has more to do with how much fuel you can put on you know, to take off. Um, last year, we had one of our jets make it from here to Stuttgart, Germany. So uh, you know, typically the Jets go from here to Boston to see a uh, Red Sox game or something like that, or, or down to the, the second home down in uh, Miami Beach or you know, things like that. But um, you can make it uh, 4,000 nautical miles in the uh, Now the uh, conditions you know, on a hot summer day, maybe that wouldn't be possible. Perhaps you have a question. Yeah, OK. <laughs> So my, my question is, um, uh, your, um, you, you make a lot of your money off of fuel, and I believe you said that you, you try to, to get that. Um, how, do you, how do you get the fuel sales, and are you in a good location in order to uh, encourage people to come into your airport to, uh, to land and, and refuel? We are. Um, we have we only have two base jets, and I have two base helicopters that also take jet fuel. Um, they represent combined probably about 20% of our jet fuel sales are based. The rest of it's all transient. We're you know we're located um, kind of along a main flyway between Buffalo and Boston, Cleveland the Cleveland to Boston flyway. So we do pick up a lot of transients. Um, and I think that's where the length of our runway helps a little bit because some of the smaller GA airports near us are between 4,500 and 5,000. Uh, so we do pick up some bigger jets. We've had Falcon 900s, Falcon 1000s, uh, Global Express 1000. Those are fairly decent sized planes coming into our airport. Um, we do have a lot of, you know, um, 
jets come in. We have a local concert venue. Um, it used to be Six Flags. It's now it's now under a different name. But you know, we have summertime. We have um, almost once a week. We have concert acts coming in on private jet. You know, Hootie and the Blowfish or Dave Matthews or whoever's in. Um, and we do have because of where we kind of happy and halfway between Buffalo and Rochester. Sometimes we get site selectors for, you know, companies that are interested in the area will come and fly in, but most of our jet fuel sales are, are transient. I would say probably 80% of our jet fuel sales are transient, which may be different than what you guys experience up here. But if you have six base jets, um, we always guesstimate that a, a base jet is anywhere between 20 to 40,000 gallons of fuel a year, depending on how much they fly. Um, and we always are chomping at the bit to get more base jets at our airport. Um, in fact, we, we actively um, advertise and promote that. We do have private development at our airport, too. We do have three hangars that have been privately developed and on, and are on land leases at the airport. Uh, two of those hangars are hangars of house jets. So um, that is something we chase based just because of the markup on the fuel. Yeah, our, actually our rent fees have not... Uh, our hangar rents really, the, the T-hangar chain, T-hangar rents have not changed in 10 years. The um, large corporate, you know, box hangar rents, uh, we generally inflate those 2% a year based on contract, pretty, pretty standard, 2% a, a year. Um, and our land leases all have a 2% inflator in them as well. I think I said rent fees, <coughs> landing. We have no landing fees at our airport. We try to keep our prices the lowest around, yeah. Harrison? Tim, uh, you said in 2001 you put out an RFP, or 2000. Can you talk about your recommendation in terms of um, RFP turnaround? We're, with, we're within a year of, uh, of contract ending. We haven't put out an RFP. I, uh, my, my Air Force experience tells me that we should have had it out I would think a year would be adequate. Um, I mean, when we put ours out, we were, we were out of time. We didn't have a contract in place. We were just putting dealers out. So um, for my, the experience we had at Genesee County, you're way ahead of the game from where we were. Um, but I would think that any, you know, if you, if you can give an operator uh, three to six months to get in here and get, get moving, it should be, should be enough time. Hector? Tim, what aircraft maintenance do you have and who does it? How many mechanics? We actually have, it's, um, we ha our aircraft maintenance is done under what we call limited fixed based operators. So we have a, a private company that rents hangar space from Genesee County and they operate an aircraft maintenance business at the airport. Um, I think it's a key piece of what we've got going on in Genesee County. Um, I think if the county, you know, if the county had to do that, I don't know that we could, or we, I don't know if you'd be able to find the experience to get that going or have anybody knowledgeable enough to run that. Um, but our, they rent basically the entire main hangar at the county airport. They rent quite a few offices in our terminal. Um, and they run a very successful avionics maintenance business. They pull planes in from as far away as Delaware, uh, Maryland area. Um, and probably even up into Canada somewhat. So um, it's kind of an interesting relationship, but um, we also have a, a limited fixed based operator in terms of a flight school. Uh, we have a flight school that operates under the same exact relationship. They rent hangar space from the, from the county to tie their, you know, to put their planes into. They have a couple tie downs that they keep rented from us, and they also rent space inside the terminal from the, directly from the county. And again, a key piece to any airport is having a you know, successful flight school to keep feeding pilots into the system and flying planes. How many mechanics does the uh, operation? The uh, private FBO has seven, I believe. How many rental aircraft? Well, the flight school has four four rental aircraft that they that they farm out.
Matt? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for coming out here, first of all. Um, can you repeat what you had mentioned about pastoral Are they a company that takes over the replacement of the FBO or the airport manager, or did I not catch that correctly? Pastoral Associates is actually an airport engineering firm. Uh, they deal with private and public airports all over the state, and probably even out of the state, um, in terms of having a, an engineer on board for your FAA or ACIP projects. Um, they were the county's airport engineer for a few years in the late 90s, and uh, the county asked them to operate our airport. It was kind of a, uh, an awkward offshoot of what they did for us engineering-wise. But they, they had a contract manager on site and basically provided some oversight to the county's operation, the day-to-day -day operation, for about a year. But it was very costly, and it was, I don't think it was very effective. Travis? Tell us a little bit about what's going on at uh, Chicago County, uh, Dunker. Well, the little bit that I know about it, they had um, George Spanos is Jeff and my counterpart. Uh, he's also a county highway superintendent under. He operates, they have two airports in Chautauqua County. They have Jamestown, which is more of a passenger airport, and they have uh, Dunkirk, that's probably very similar to what we've got going on here. Um, the FBO at Dunkirk basically provided two months' notice and said, we're done, we're out of here. So the county was going to, and they, they had basically had a private uh, FBO relationship there. The county really didn't have much involvement other than just some, some minor maintenance of the airfield. Um, so they were kind of scrambling to find somebody to fill that void. And I believe that uh, Chautauqua County is going to be kind of following what we did in our county and providing airport manager uh, taking over the fuel sales and the rentals of the hangars. Um, but I don't know beyond that any more specifics to give you any more detail. Great. Thank you, Chairman. Tim, could you describe again the management structure that's in place? Um, well, I guess I would be, I'm the county highway superintendent, but I have, um, our department's really more like a public works department. We have facilities, we have the airport, parks, um, environmental health operates under our department, uh, countywide water. There's, there's multiple divisions under my, under my supervision, but the airport is under my direct supervision. We have a full-time airport manager um, that is a, a management, you know, management level staff. And then we have, under him, there is one full-time uh, airport attendant, I think is his title. And then we also have three part-time airport fuel attendants. And the, the airport attendant and the three part-timers are the ones that basically operate the line service at the airport, pumping, you know, pumping fuel and uh, moving planes and, and running hangars. And the rest of the services provided at the airport are all uh, provided by the county through other, you know, through either my department or other departments and charged back through the, through the different funds. Did your, <coughs> excuse me, did your department have to add on anybody extra to take care of whatever accounting or management was needed? No, the, um, we, we've always had two, two office staff at the highway department um, and uh, the airport, the, the billing of fuel and the billing of rent uh, and all the accounts payable and accounts receivable was just added on to the highway staff and we didn't we didn't add anybody on it was just kind of gobbled up. Thank you. Ken? How do you provide emergency services for the airport? Um, our EMS is through the, the town fire department and the, our county EMS facility is actually about a half mile north of the airport. Um, they have some AFFF, an AFFF truck stationed there but pretty much all the emergency responses, either through the Sheriff's Department or through the Town Fire Department. Who's responsible for training on that truck that's at the airport? Our County EMS Director takes takes that over. So you have a County EMS? Yep. Tom? Yeah, thank you for coming today. How hard is it for the County to find good management in the sense of your airport manager? <coughs> if our County is thinking about going down this route, hard finding the right person for that job? Or do you think that they're out there? No, I think they're out there. Um, we we tried a couple different ways when we first started out. We had, um, you know, we were trying to, for a little while, trying to kill two birds with one stone. We had hired somebody that had an engineering background uh, that could manage some of the federal aid projects 
um, and then do the airport management at the same time. Um, and I think that was distracting from a, the management of the operation, from the safety and the marketing of it and treating it like a business. Uh, we did that for about two years and then we actually ended up promoting uh, one of our fuel attendants from inside, um, pulled them up to management and they've done an awesome job. Uh, you know, really their their airport experience at that time was pretty much limited to just the, you know, fuel, fueling airplanes. And they just had, uh, you know, they had the work ethic and the, and the ability to learn and picked it all up and been running. He's been out there for 15 years now. So I think if you have the right person, uh, the right, you don't, I don't, you don't have to be an, an air, airport expert, I think, as long as you're uh, you know, a good manager. Uh, you can you can learn the the fuel the fuel safety the aviation safety type stuff can be picked up pretty quickly. It's just having somebody with a good shoulder on their heads. Ron, the uh, the rebuilding of the airport that <coughs> you've done through the years <coughs> was mo most of that done with federal grants. Yes, all of the horizontal work, um, fencing, lighting, uh, aprons. Um, Runways, taxiways has all been done under federal aid. Uh, we have been very aggressive in chasing state grants for any of the facility improvements because you can't use uh, federal dollars on facility improvements or revenue generating improvements. Uh, but we've been very aggressive chasing state either uh, for a while it was called Air 99. Uh, there was a 2005, 2005 Bond Act that we chased, the Aviation Bond Act. Um, a lot of our tea hangers uh, were more than 50% funded by state aid. We, have, we secured a million dollar grant to help offset some of the costs on our terminal redevelopment. So uh, we've been very aggressive in chasing that. And I think that's been helpful. It, I mean, it's taken our uh, T hanger payback from about a, what would normally be about a 12 or 13 year payback down to probably six or seven years. <coughs> you know, one of the problems that we're facing is that one of the arguments is that when you're using the uh, federal grants, it's still taxpayers' money, and uh, our argument has been on, on that issue that, uh, no, it isn't. It's the, the guys that are flying that uh, they ticket uh, revenue. And that's correct. And, and that's, uh, a big, that's a big um, education piece that we use with the community, because we did have a very vocal group in the community saying, tax, it's, you know, federal, state, local, it's still tax dollars. And the reality yeah, you is, have them too, huh? oh yeah. And the reality of it is, is that you know the aviation trust fund is funded by just like you said, ticket prices and fees. If you've never flown in a plane or fly planes, you've never contributed toward that money. So, and the other argument that yeah. someone's going to get it. So, um, standing on your principles and saying it's tax money, we don't want to take it. Well, you know, if we don't take it, you guys might take it up here, or somebody's going to take it in New Jersey or wherever. So, um, you know, you might as well bring something back to your community. Most of the work that we've done in our airport has all been local contractors for the most part. Uh, I would say within the probably a three county region. You know, they're buying, and they're doing runway reconstruction, they're buying asphalt and stone right in our county. It's not coming from anywhere else. So, um, you know, there's an indirect benefit of that money coming back to the community too. Thank you. Doctor? Fuel <coughs> have sort of unpredictable demand. So if you've had a good week, you can call in and we um I and mean we do our bud our budgeting we we you know we do it on our best guess you know we look at our last few years and try to average it out it is very volatile because of weather and pricing and just the economy in general um you know, this year was a tough year because it was really wet in the spring time. Um, but we've been making up for it with the, you know, that's kind of an extended fall. So um, internally, in terms of uh, how we handle it, uh, we, we do a, a bid that basically is, I think it's a seven year bid. It's got, it's got a kind of a fixed four year term and then three one year renewals. But we put out an aviation fuel products bid um, and we get a vendor, to, we vendors, multiple vendors have always bid on it to provide either fuel trucks on lease, uh, the POS station for the fueling, 
um, and includes training for the guys and girls that work at the airport. Um, some marketing products. It's pretty. It's a pretty comprehensive fit, but it's it basically that's where we draw our 100 low lead and our jet pricing from. And because it's on bid, we just and you know, we order it and it's budgeted for. We have two 12,000 gallon tanks and we have uh, two mobile trucks. Our Jet A trucks, 2,200 gallons. Our 100 low lead trucks, 1,200 gallons. And when usually when we get down to two to three thousand gallons, we order it up and it's generally there within a day or two. So it's actually pretty pretty painless. Chairman? Did you say that the trucks are provided as part of the fuelation? <coughs> yeah, you can, I mean, you can obviously buy your own trucks um, or you can lease them from, from your aviation service provider. We, we lease, we have a, our contract is with Ascent Aviation, which is out of Parish. Uh, they provide a Phillips 66 product and we do lease our fuel trucks from them on a month-to-month -month contractual basis. Would it be possible for uh, you to send uh, uh, Jeff a, a copy of that uh, tonight? Yep, absolutely. And that's what Chautauqua County, I think Chautauqua County actually piggybacked off of our, our bid and they're entering into contract with Phillips 66 as well. So there are pay piggyback provisions? Yep. Tim, my question would be, <coughs> You know, we've privatized it, and in my tenure, the 12 years I've been on, there's been a lot of looking at that, that the private sector can do it better, more efficiently, and et cetera. And, uh, you know, that's that's where we're at here, and we're bringing you you in to, to do the opposite. My question to you is, have since you've taken it over as a municipality, have you ever considered going back to privatization for whatever reason? Um, we, I, we haven't, just because we've been... I use the term profitable. Like I, I, like I said, if you factor in the capital expense, I think we're break even, which I think is pretty still pretty, pretty good position for any airport to be in. Um, but because we've been successful, we haven't we haven't thought about going private. Um, I you know I'm here giving you my my experience on the public, but I I mentioned this to Jeff before. I I think it can work on either end. I think a private operation can work. I think a public operation can work. Where you get difficulty is when you're stuck somewhere in between halfway. I think that's where it gets very confusing from a leadership standpoint um, and who's taking the money and, and covering costs. I think you almost kind of have to be all the way to the one side or all the way to the other. Um, private, a private contract can work. You just have to have um, you know, favorable terms because there's pieces that the county's probably always going to have part of. You're always going to have the maintenance of the facility, uh, you know, mowing or plowing. You know, you probably should always have an airport manager on staff to, to kind of referee what's going on out there. You have to have somebody there to enforce the rules and regulations so that, you know, who is running it privately, you know, isn't doing things so much in their favor or not treating um, tenants equitably. Um, so you kind of have to have, you're going to have some overhead there, even if you go all the way to the one side private. It, probably the key thing is to make sure the terms of your contract generate enough revenue to offset um, what you've got in, in it from a management standpoint. John? Yeah, well, we've had three economic studies done on the airport, two done by New York State DOT, and then one done by Wiedemann Associates. But the bottom line is, for every dollar that is invested in the airport, it brings $10 to the regional economy. And that's one of the educational things that we're, we're working on. Have you worked with that as well? Yeah, we had the same same studies done. DOT did one. Uh, Wiedemann Associates was work, worked with us uh, quite a bit before we did, did our runway extension. In fact, they did a business plan for us that showed us potential uh, revenue generation by expanding the runway. Um, and I've kept in touch with Randall. He's a, he's a, he's a good guy. Um, yeah, there, the thing that I've always sold to our legislature and, and our community is that the airport is really no different than the roads and bridges. It's a piece of the transportation infrastructure that is being used maybe by a smaller component of the community, but it's still being used by people to get places, to bring in service and products, and, and, and conduct business. It's, it's really no different than what we do for roads and bridges. We spend you know, $9 million a year on our road system, and we don't generate 
you know, we don't generate any revenue from our road system. That's just money spent. It's gone. Especially when you look at something like plowing snow. I think that's the, you know, it's the biggest waste of money ever. All you're doing is pushing something off that's going to melt away. But if you didn't do that, you know, people aren't getting to school. They're not going to get to their business. The economy's not going to move. You know, products aren't going to go from the farm to the market. So, um, the airport's really no different. Even if you even if you operate an airport that's losing money, um, it's still like you said, it has a, a definitely a direct connection to your the economy in your community. Well, we're having trouble trying to bring to the public. It's there. Is that the runway extension will further enhance that economic benefit to the region? So we'll work on that. Right. That, um, so in the best case scenario, you can break even. Just said with your capital expenses, in a good year, we're going to break even. Right. Okay. That's a good year. We're not making money. In a good year, we're going to break even. We got all this liability. We got all this expenses, and we're going to break even. That's a good year. Now, if the, your legislator went to you and said, "Hey, we can cut four or five hundred thousand dollars out by having a private uh, uh, enterprise run the airport," what would you say? I I'd, I'd probably question it. I don't know that. I don't know where the savings would be. I mean, right, you know, right now we take in all the revenue. So if I if I enter into a private private arrangement, um, I would say that you're gonna you're gonna take going from 100 percent of the market on fuel sales probably down to like five or six percent of the market revenue on fuel sales. Um, you're gonna go from 100 percent of your hangar rents down to probably one and a half to two percent of the hangar rents. So um, if I had to look at you know what we have in terms of overhead, I've got probably, uh, if I'm keeping my airport manager, I probably got, just to say rough numbers, say 80, 80 to $100,000 in, in salary and benefits. Um, I've got 20000 in custodial, probably 25000 in facility maintenance, another um, probably fifty in pavement maintenance, and then probably another um, fifty to 100000 in terms of snow plowing and, and mowing. So, you know, I've, I've got just rough numbers, probably three or four hundred thousand dollars of expenses just to run just to run the air manage the airport and still have a private contract. Why do you have to do all the maintenance though? What if it, what if it's in the RFP or FQ that we don't have liability for the maintenance? That's part of the RFQ. You're assuming that all of a sudden you're the way I'm hearing it, you're assuming that the county still does all the maintenance, the county still does all this. Do we have to? I mean No, if you could find a I mean if you could find a private operator to do that well, yeah. What if the private operator already had things in place, and other uh, already had the trucks, and all those things, and that's part of that RFQ or P? That's a huge expense. That you're saying, well, the county still has. Well, the county wouldn't have that. So that's where I'm getting at. You know, say, so, so I'm, you know, um, and then you're saying, well, we got to have a hundred thousand dollar airport manager. Well, I'm not so sure I agree with that either. Because part of you is saying you don't want to, you don't want to be part county and part private, now you say, well, you got to have an airport manager, 100K. I, you know, I'm getting mixed signals there, to be honest with you, Tim. I'm not getting a clear-cut message. Chairman? Yeah. No, uh, Tim, that was a great answer. Yeah, we could have that, but then we wouldn't have the revenue. That's, that's yeah, like I said, if, you can, if yeah. you can find an operator to provide all that stuff for you, then that's awesome. But to get back on the um, program that you, you're conducting, the um, aircraft maintenance So did you offer um, an actual RFP on that? Uh, did you have, are they local? Are they, uh, uh, do they have local locations? Um, you mentioned that, did you say three and a half mechanics? They have seven mechanics. Seven mechanics, how big a facility? Uh, um, our main hangar is about 15,000 feet, roughly, and they have about 2,200 square feet in the terminal. They've actually been a longtime tenant of the airport. They were there before the county took the facility over. So we were kind of, we kind of inherited them from, you know, they've been there in operation for 30 to 35 years. And just the, to the extent that you know, what would you say would be the breakdown on the, on the maintenance jet versus general aviation? It's almost all, it's almost all, it's almost all general aviation. 
small planes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, planes actually coming in from other places. Oh, yeah. For, for Quite a few, yeah. Program. Program. And they only they're they only operate out of our airport. They don't have any other locations. So they're actually locally based. Does anyone else have any other questions? Tim, we can't thank you enough. You were excellent. And we think you brought a lot to the table here, and thanks for the education and coming all the way out. out. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. That's very nice. Okay, where are we going? You were at the game yesterday? Yeah. We got buried by snow. <laughs> well, I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. I went to UB. My son went to UB. My relatives lived in Buffalo and Clarence. Yeah, it was probably snowing. Okay, our next item on the agenda is the distribution of the draft FBO, RFP, RFQ, and we have uh, some confidentiality issues, and we'd like Mary to speak to that uh, before it gets handed out. If it's okay with you, I'd like to turn it over to Brian. Okay. And Brian? Thanks, Thanks Mr. Chairman. I prepared a memo uh, that will go with the packages today, and it's just an outline of why we think that the, it's very important that the draft documents remain confidential at this point. One, uh, they are draft. They're not in their final form. Presumably, uh, the committee uh, and members of the board are going to add some things into that that will change the final uh, solicitation that goes out to the public. To that extent, if there are going to be strategies or tactics or uh, things that are going to become part of our negotiating position in that process, to reveal them now is going to work against us and it could work against us significantly as far as our return on the program. The other thing is from a standpoint, I think it's very important that these documents all go to any prospective bidder and to the members of the public who want to see them at exactly the same time. To the extent anybody gets a sneak preview of that, that could uh, impact the integrity of the competitive process, and we would want that to call the whole process into question. Okay, anyone have questions for Brian at this point? When do you expect it to be public? The committee says so. We will we will have another meeting scheduled for the 18th next Monday at 10 o'clock. We'll field questions and uh, review. Uh, most of it probably will be an executive session because of provisions there that are economical based and uh, without tipping our hand. And I would believe, am I speaking out of turn, that when we iron out all those issues after the review of the committee, it should be available shortly thereafter. You would agree? And I think all we have left is there's no other questions is we're just going to distribute them. Uh, please review them in the next week and we'll be meet back here the 18th at 10 o'clock for your questions, comments, changes, corrections, or add-ons. Okay. Just uh, so all the supervisors are aware, we made full copies including all the appendices for the committee members. And then I have copies of the RFP text which is kind of the really the guiding document. Um, the appendices are more of just background information. So I have copies of those for the other supervisors that aren't on the committee. But if, it, if those supervisors would like a, an entire copy, it's just, you know, more paper, but we can we can certainly provide that here quickly. Um, it is quite an expansive package, so. <coughs> Doug? Um, here's the challenge I got. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an engineer. And I think a lot of this is going to be legalese terms and, and engineering uh, uh, and technical information. I want to have the ability to go to experts that I think are experts to help me dissect this. I mean, I don't know if there's anybody an engineer in this crew here uh, or lawyers. So, in all honesty, we're going to be reading stuff that we don't have a clue about. We don't know, have a clue about. And so, I think we should have the opportunity to bring in an expert if we feel, if Ron feels he needs an expert to help him dissect it, I think he should have that right to do so. Brian? What's, what's your thought on that? Well, <coughs> I'd defer it to Brian if you don't mind. Jackson uh, Engineer, uh, the engineers in the DPW shop, John Attorney's office, I'm assigned to this project, so we can do uh, all those questions we want. I, I don't think there are any more here.
Um, I think Doug, um, I want to tag on what Doug said. I think an expert that could go through this and say, you haven't left this out, or you have left this out. This is, you know, somebody who's been through this process, um, you know, uh, there's probably an attorney or a consultant that has done this on behalf of an entity, but they could do a cursory review or, you know, probably wouldn't take a few hours to go through it and say, geez, you left out this, you know, because we're supervising. We may not see that potential. Go ahead. What we're planning on doing is releasing it in two parts. So the first part is the request for qualifications, but that's going to have the entire packet. It's just that the part two is going to be a draft. So it's still going to be released at the, the same time to everyone. And then people can make comments on it, and Julie can actually issue addendums to it that will change the part two, and then that will become final after the addendums are issued. So that's the time for everyone to make comments on it and change it and show it to experts. And But it's still being released all at the same time. Right. No, no, I'm okay with that. But I'm just saying, you know, we're, su we're supervisors. We're not. We haven't been through this process. And we worked hard to come up with all the details. But what if there's one detail that we missed? We find out that we're going to, we missed it. It's too late. Is there? There's but, still time for that after who, it's released. I'm sorry. Okay. So I just wanted to bring that up, and I think we should do that. Matt? Thank you, Mr. Uh, I don't know if this is a question for you or for mine. Tomorrow, I'm more interested in our airport advisory committee. There are a few members here of that committee. Do they get a copy of this as well, the one that you discussed with them? Not until after the 18th meeting when we have our review. Travis? Yeah, I'm not going to ask for a copy, but you know, <coughs> there are some people here that are better qualified than me and I think could help. Um, you know, you missed this, you missed that. One of them would be Mr. Hens if he would be interested in getting a copy. Another would be someone like Tom Clements, uh, who I'm sure he could sign some sort of, I know he's a lawyer, and he could sign some sort of agreement that he's not going to pull out. I think it would behoove you And I, I don't think it's our intent at all to leave anyone out. It's the intent is to make sure we file proper bidding protocol so that we don't do something that we shouldn't have. And we felt that there is still time for that input from those people uh, to make addendums and corrections or whatever at a, at a time more specific to that than uh, where we're at right now. Harrison? Again, uh, I would suggest that a schedule of all this stuff may may scratch the itch of some of the supervisors. So it's going to be a request for qualification uh, with with a draft RFP attached. You know, typically my experience with that is okay. It's going to be out there for 30. You know, there's got to be 30 days, 60 days. Somebody's got to decide what the schedule is and when the final RFP is due and when the release is going to be done and when the transition is going to be done. I, I'm I'm worried that 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 hasn't been done in a timely manner. Ron, uh, Mr. Hens, the uh, <coughs> the opportunity you you obviously went through an RFP procedure. This will be one of our first times doing it for the airport, and uh, the the point that uh, Travis made is that would would you have an interest in in perhaps doing a uh, a small consulting uh, job for us? Uh, for a couple of hours, two or three hours, and and, and review this with us uh, for us. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have a problem with that. If that's something you're willing, if that's something you're interested in. Okay, I just I, I offer that up as a suggestion to our chairman. Okay, and we can uh, speak to that, you know, next Monday also. Yeah. yeah no, um, this the subject of hiring a a consultant that with specific experience for these types of contracts was brought up probably three or four, maybe more than that. I think in our working group we talked about it. Ross had, had talked to some consulting firms that do this, specialize in this. 
And so what I can do before next Monday is uh, get that information from Ross too and what more a more formal contract, outside contract to do essentially a peer review at this point. We have a good basis. We have a lot of information as you can see from the the, the information in this RFP. It's uh, it's really quite comprehensive and I think a peer review would be a good thing um, at some point. So I'll bring some more information on that on Monday as well. Okay. Anyone else have questions or comments? Okay, motion to adjourn. By Ron, seconded by John. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved.